record. To the second session of the Catholic Eco Investor Accelerator Virtual Forum. Um, we have a little bit of um, housekeeping to take care of at the very beginning. Uh, these webinars uh, are recorded and they will be available for viewing later on the Faith and Common Good YouTube channel. We'll also send all the um, registrants a notification to the link of that um, YouTube video. We have French and English um, interpretation available today. If you check on the bottom of your screen, you will see a, a globe icon. When you click that, it will allow you to choose which language you prefer to listen to. Um, the um, interpretation will be simultaneous and the um, interpreter's voice will be at 80% or, and the original speaker will be at 20% or you can choose to turn the original speaker's volume off so that you can hear things better. Um, we ask that if you have any questions for our panelists, you place them in the chat box. Lucy Cummings will be watching the chat box for us. And once each of the, once the three presenters have finished their, their um, um, opening presentation, which today will be in uh, interview form, we will then have time for questions towards the end. At the beginning of every Global Catholic Climate Movement Canada meeting, we begin with a prayer and with a land acknowledgement. So I invite everyone to join me if you wish, but with your own microphones muted um, to, to say this creation care with me. God of the universe, we thank you for your many good gifts, for the beauty of creation and its rich and varied fruits, for clean water and fresh air, for food, and shelter, animals, and plants. Forgive us for the times we have taken the Earth's resources for granted and wasted what you have given us. Transform our hearts so that we would learn to care and share, to touch the Earth with gentleness and with love, respecting all living things. We pray for all those who suffer as a result of our waste, greed, and indifference. And we pray that the day would come when everyone has enough food and clean water. Help us to respect the rights of all people and all species, and help us to willingly share your gifts today and always. Amen. And that prayer is courtesy of the Catholic Health Association of the United States. This land acknowledgement uh, is used by um, GCCM Canada and Faith in the Common Good, and it recognizes our national scope. GCCM Canada acknowledges that our projects from coast to coast to coast are on traditional territories of diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis people. We seek to live in respect, peace and right relations and are mindful of broken covenants. By making a land acknowledgement, we are taking part in an act of reconciliation, honoring the land and indigenous heritage, which dates back over 10,000 years. As a community, we have the responsibility to honor and respect all the creator has given us and to provided us with life. This includes the land, water, air, fire, animals, plants, and our ancestors. Now, I wanna take just a brief moment to, to reiterate um, why the Global Catholic Climate Movement has embarked on this project and, and our reasons um, come both from Catholic social teaching and social thought and directly from Pope Francis. Um, on many occasions, he said that uh, people of faith need to recognize our uh, responsibility to each other and to, and to the earth, our common home. Uh, in his most recent encyclical Fratelli Tutti, Pope Francis pointed out that our relationships include financial ones. And those relationships can only be built up through the development of a culture of encounter in which every voice can be heard and all can thrive, finding points of contact, building bridges, and envisioning long-term inclusive projects. So the Global Catholic Climate Movement Canada has um, created this forum in order to uh, create a culture of encounter. And we hope that you find 
wonderful information that you can use and take back to your own organizations. Pope Francis invited young people from around the world, economists, entrepreneurs, and change makers uh, to take part in a forum last year um, to examine what can be done to create an economy of Francesco, similar to what he's asking in Fratelli Tutti. The young people had 12 items in their statements that they would like to ask of us and economists, now entrepreneurs, political and decision makers. I have two of their 12 asks on the screen. One uh, is around uh, economic ideologies and that they never again be used to offend and reject the poor, the sick minorities and disadvantaged peoples. Item number eight in their list of 12 is that companies and banks, especially large and globalized ones, introduce an independent ethics committee in their governance with a veto on the environment, justice, and the impacts on the poorest. They say, as they close their, um, their, their statement, that our times are too difficult to ask for anything but the impossible. Uh, I'm having trouble seeing my screen. Uh, they say that if we don't ask the impossible, though, um, they feel that they won't be asking enough. So that is um, um, some of the strong reasons and impetus for why we are doing these things. I'm going to take a, a minute or two to introduce each of our speakers today, and then we will begin. So, Mamadou Lamine Baye, and I hope, Mamadou, I'm produced, pronouncing your name correctly, holds diplomas in environmental management and sustainable development. He's worked at Group Investissement Responsable Montreal from 2007 until 2017 as an environmental analyst and director of the African Division. He was a climate change analyst at the Quebec Ministry of Development, the environmental and the fight against climate change in 2018. He has since founded Inventissimo Responsable Afrique that helps clients such as banks, asset managers, pension funds, and NGOs in their engagement with companies. Since 2019, he's been an environmental and social management consultant offering Afri sorry, covering Africa at the International Finance Corporation. Mamadou is joining us on our call today from Morocco, I believe. If I'm, if I'm wrong, you can correct me, Mamadou. Jonathan Smith is uh, an ESG analyst and energy industry specialist based in Toronto, and he currently manages the ethical, social, and governance research for the global oil, gas, and coal sectors at Sustainalytics. His role focuses on risk, on sector risk analysis and the assessment of controversial business activities and their impacts on stakeholders and shareholders. Jonathan holds a master's degree in sustainability management from the University of Toronto, as well as an undergraduate degree in global management and finance from Ryerson University. And our third presenter today is Anthony Schein, Director of Shareholder Advocacy at SHARE and has dedicated and has been dedicated to social and political change through civic engagement, community development and trade unionism. Prior to joining SHARE, Anthony spent almost a decade in senior roles at an Ontario public sector trade union, where he worked with senior leadership on advocacy, governance, campaigns, and negotiations. Anthony has earned an honors BA in political theory and cultural studies from Marlboro College. He's also pursued graduate studies in communications and cultural studies at York and Ryerson universities. So, as I mentioned, um, our, our presentations today will take the style of an interview, and our first will be with Mamadou. So, welcome Mamadou. I'm really pleased that you're here with us today. Can you tell us about the importance of understanding the financial risks to our investments due to climate change? Uh, yes, so thank you for giving me the opportunity to share my experience in the engagement with uh, excuse me, 
Donc, merci en tout cas de m'avoir invité dans ce, en tout cas, ce webinaire pour partager mon expérience en matière d'engagement euh, actionnarial. Donc, pour répondre à ta question, donc, avant d'expliquer un peu c'est quoi les risques liés au changement climatique dans les financements, je voulais d'abord donc un peu identifier avec vous c'est quoi les risques liés au changement climatique avant de parler donc de, de c'est quoi les risques avant de parler des impacts financiers. Donc les risques sont divisés en deux types donc il y a les risques de transition et les risques physiques. Donc les risques de transition dont, on, dont les risques de transition donc regroupe tout ce qui est politique, euh, réglementation, les technologies, donc les changements dans le marché qui accompagne en tout cas les politiques d'adaptation et de lutte contre les changements climatiques. Et donc, pour, comme premier donc, risque, je peux parler de risques politiques. Donc, vous savez que pour respecter donc, certains engagements en matière de changement climatique, plusieurs pays ont mis en place des politiques, soit des politiques de réduction de gaz, d'émission de gaz à effet de serre, ou bien des, des politiques d'efficacité énergétique, ou bien des politiques en tout cas d'adaptation au changement climatique. On peut voir, par exemple, des pays comme la Suède, l'Australie ou l'Allemagne qui ont décidé de se débarrasser complètement du charbon. Et d'autres pays aussi ont mis en place des objectifs de réduction des émissions de gaz à effet de serre et des objectifs par rapport aux énergies renouvelables. Le deuxième risque, c'est le risque lié aux réglementations et aux poursuites. On a vu que donc, ces dernières années, on a vu une augmentation des poursuites liées au changement climatique que, parce que certaines organisations n'ont pas soit euh, mis en place des mesures de réduction ou bien n'ont pas mis en place des mesures d'adaptation au changement climatique ou bien surtout simplement n'ont pas divulgué donc, les risques qui sont liés au changement climatique. Si bien que ces dernières années, donc, on a enregistré pas mal de poursuites euh, de la part soit de, de propriétaires de maisons ou bien de compagnies d'assurance ou bien d'autres parties prenantes donc, qui ont été touchées par ces impacts. Un autre risque, donc, c'est le risque lié au marché. Donc, on a vu que les changements au niveau de la demande de produits qui, qui sont plus favorables au changement climatique fait que certaines euh, entreprises donc, sont privilégiées par, par, par rapport à d'autres. Donc, les entreprises qui mettent en place des produits qui permettent d'économiser de l'énergie, qui permettent de réduire les émissions de gaz à effet de serre, donc, ont euh, pris des marchés par rapport à, à certains qui n'ont pas encore mis en place ces, ces, ces genres de produits-là. Donc, ça crée des, des, des gagnants et des perdants. Donc, ceux qui sont proactifs sont les gagnants et ceux qui sont donc, euh, en retard donc, sont les perdants. Donc, à ces risques, j'ajoute le risque de réputation, donc lié à la perception de plus en plus des gens que, que les gens ont par rapport aux entreprises qui contribuent à augmenter donc, les changements climatiques et la bonne réputation par rapport aux entreprises, au contraire, qui donc, contribuent à la lutte contre ces changements climatiques-là. Donc, une fois ces risques donc, euh, identifiés, donc les risques de transition, on va parler après des risques physiques, mais je voulais donc euh, donner les risques financiers qui sont liés à ces risques euh, de transition. Donc, le premier risque financier, donc, c'est déjà l'augmentation des coûts d'opération. Parce que comme s'il y a de nouvelles réglementations qui sont plus sévères, aussi bien pour les entreprises, donc ça euh, demande plus d'investissement, en tout cas pour respecter ces, euh, donc ces réglementations, si bien qu'on a vu qu'avec les réglementations aux États-Unis, avec l'arrivée d'Obama, il y a beaucoup d'entreprises liées au charbon qui ont fermé leurs portes parce que si elles voulaient donc investir pour se conformer aux réglementations, elles risquent de ne, pas, de ne plus être rentables. Donc si bien qu'elles étaient obligées de fermer donc, au lieu de donc d'essayer de se confirmer à ces réglementations. Donc, l'autre impact financier, donc c'est la restriction au niveau des licences ou bien au niveau donc d'accès à certains à certains actifs, parce que on sait que si un pays, par exemple, a un objectif de réduction d'émission de gaz à effet de serre de tel pourcentage, donc si toutes les réserves de ces pays-là sont exploitées, donc on risque de dépasser donc ce donc cet objectif, si bien que donc même si les réserves sont là, il y a certaines entreprises qui ne vont pas les exploiter parce que si on exploite toutes ces réserves-là, on va dépasser donc, les objectifs fixés euh, avec l'entente de Paris et les objectifs qui se sont fixés plusieurs pays. Si bien que même si les actifs sont là, il y a une restriction par rapport à, à leur exploitation. 
c'est qu'on appelle des fois donc, les actifs échoués ou bien la bulle carbone. Donc, beaucoup d'entreprises ont des réserves qu'elles qu comptabilisent comme réserves, mais elles ne vont pas pouvoir les exploiter. Un autre risque financier, c'est le paiement d'amende ou bien de taxes. Par exemple, dans des pays où il y a la taxe carbone, donc, où les entreprises qui ne font pas d'efforts risquent de perdre beaucoup d'argent dans ce, dans ce système de paiement. Les entreprises aussi qui ne respectent pas les réglementations, donc qui font face à des poursuites, payent beaucoup d'argent pour respecter les réglementations qui sont liées au changement climatique. Un autre risque financier, c'est le risque de revenus. Donc, comme j'ai dit, il y a une préférence de plusieurs clients par rapport aux produits qui contribuent à la réduction des émissions de gaz à effet de serre, qui contribuent à l'aide des économies d'énergie. Donc, si bien que certaines entreprises risquent de perdre des clients dans ce secteur-là, par contre, ceux qui sont, celles qui sont proactives, ça constitue une opportunité pour les entreprises qui sont préactives. Il y a aussi un autre risque qui est lié à l'inquiétude des investisseurs par rapport donc à des entreprises qui ne font pas beaucoup d'efforts en matière de changement climatique. Donc, on voit des campagnes des investissements, d'autres des campagnes de restriction par rapport à certaines entreprises, en tout cas, qui sont de mauvais élèves. Donc, ça limite aussi l'accès aux investissements donc, au niveau de ces, de ces entreprises. Et le dernier risque financier que je vais citer, c'est le risque lié à, euh, donc au, à la chaîne d'approvisionnement et à l'interruption des, euh, des opérations, parce que s'il y a une poursuite, donc si les opérations ne sont pas arrêtées, ils risquent d'être interrompus. Et donc, s'il y a une réglementation aussi qui élimine un produit, donc une entreprise qui n'est pas proactive risque donc de, euh, de perdre certains clients et de, de compromettre en tout cas sa chaîne d'approvisionnement. Et pour donner un exemple concret qui est d'entreprise de, qui est victime de ces risques de transition, je pense que l'exemple de Keystone XL est un, est un exemple euh, évident que plusieurs personnes connaissent parce que c'est une entreprise donc, qui avait un projet de, de l'éduc entre le Canada et les États-Unis. Puis on a vu que suivant les gouvernements qui sont arrivés depuis Bush jusqu'à Obama, ensuite Trump jusqu'à Biden, donc chacun... Donc, le projet a été approuvé, ensuite euh, rejeté, ensuite approuvé, ensuite rejeté. Donc, actuellement, l'entreprise le, a décidé de le suspendre à cause de ces, toutes ces, ces, ces difficultés, alors qu'elle avait dé, déjà dépensé plus de 2 milliards, euh, 2 milliards de dollars. Donc, c'est vraiment de, de l'argent qui est perdu parce que, euh, malgré ses efforts, il a finalement décidé d'arrêter ce projet-là, alors que, on a vu qu'il y avait pas mal d'engagement de, de la part de plusieurs investisseurs euh, qui demandaient en tout cas, qui étaient opposés à ce projet et que, qui ont fait beaucoup de campagnes avec euh, l'entreprise. Et malheureusement, l'entreprise n'a pas coopéré. Et on voit où est-ce que donc, le problème est arrivé. Un autre exemple, donc, ça c'est en Afrique, euh, au Kenya. Donc, il y a un projet de centrale au charbon donc, qui était prévu dans une réserve et de sites site d'héritage de l'UNESCO et ce projet-là aussi a été arrêté suite à une, à une amende, à une poursuite donc, par les communautés et par certaines ONG, malgré que le projet était soutenu par le gouvernement, mais le projet a été arrêté finalement. Donc ça, c'est des exemples qui montrent que les risques de transition sont là et peuvent avoir des impacts financiers au niveau donc, des entreprises. Donc je parle maintenant des risques physiques qui sont moins nombreux, donc, mais qui peuvent être en tout cas très euh, nocifs pour les entreprises. Donc, on distingue deux types de risques physiques. Donc, les risques, ce qu'on appelle les risques, les risques physiques accrus. Donc, ça veut dire que les, ce sont les risques qui sont liés aux événements climatiques intenses comme les ouragans, les, euh, donc les inondations, les cyclones. Donc, ça, c'est des risques donc, qui présentent des, qui peuvent avoir des impacts physiques. On peut avoir aussi des risques qui sont plus étalés sur le, dans le temps. Par exemple, l'élévation du niveau de la mer ou bien certaines sécheresses. Donc, ce aussi sont les classes parmi les risques physiques. Et il faut identifier, donc, on peut voir quels sont donc l'impact de ces risques sur le plan financier aussi. Donc, le premier risque, c'est donc, la destruction des actifs. Donc, quand il y a une inondation ou bien il y a un ouragan, on voit les dégâts qui sont causés partout dans le monde. Donc, si les entreprises qui n'ont pas mis en place, en tout cas, des infrastructures qui permettent de résister à ces risques-là, donc, font face donc, à des destructions de, leur, de leurs actifs. Un autre risque, c'est le risque de perturbation de la chaîne d'approvisionnement. Euh, parce que 
euh, si c'est dans le secteur agricole, ça peut détruire les cultures. Si c'est dans un autre secteur, ça peut rendre l'accès aux ressources donc, euh, euh, impossible. Si bien qu'il peut y avoir des perturbations dans les opérations ou bien dans la chaîne d'approvisionnement. L'autre point, c'est la disponibilité des ressources. Donc, ça peut avoir un impact sur la qualité, la, euh, la quantité de l'eau qu'on utilise dans les opérations. L'autre risque aussi, c'est l'accès aux assurances. Ça augmente les coûts d'assurance parce que plus l'entreprise fait face à des, euh, en tout cas à des, à des perturbations liées à ces événements-là. Donc, euh, les, les, les frais d'assurance risquent d'augmenter aussi. Et puis, le dernier risque, c'est le silé à la dépréciation des, des actifs. Si vos actifs se trouvent dans un endroit qui est très exposé au risque climatique, donc ça peut entraîner une dépréciation et en tout cas euh, mener aussi à des, à des actifs échoués. Donc, un exemple concret aussi dans ce secteur des risques physiques, je peux donner l'exemple d'Aramco, qui est une entreprise qui est euh, saoudienne. Donc, d'après une étude qui a été menée par une, une firme Cal Calendar, donc, qui évolue dans la donc, dans l'étude des risques climatiques, il a été montré que cette entreprise donc, qui se situe au niveau de la péninsule arabique, qui est très exposée aux événements climatiques, donc fait, fait face à quatre types de risques. Donc, le premier, c'est le risque qui est lié aux températures élevées. Donc, parce que quand les températures atteignent certains niveaux, donc certains équipements ne, ne fonctionnent plus et certains équipements aussi fonctionnent moins. Donc, soit elles arrêtent de fonctionner, soit elles, elles, elles fonctionnent moins. Le deuxième risque, c'est le risque qui est lié à, à l'élévation du niveau de la mer parce que c'est une entreprise qui dépend beaucoup du transport maritime. Donc, beaucoup de ces installations sont, se situent au niveau des de, de côtes. Donc, s'il y a l'augmentation euh, du niveau de la mer, donc, ces installations risquent d'être euh, inondées. Et il y a beaucoup aussi de salinisation donc, de ces, qui augmente la corrosion au niveau des matériels. Donc, ça, c'est un autre risque qu'il faut regarder par rapport donc, à cette entreprise. L'autre risque, c'est le risque de manque d'eau. On sait qu'au niveau de la péninsule arabique, c'est surtout le désert. Donc, il y a pas mal de sécheresse. Donc, et les réserves en eau ne cessent de s'épuiser. On sait que l'industrie pétrolière, pétrolière a besoin de beaucoup d'eau. Si bien que l'entreprise, pour assurer donc, ses ressources en eau, fait installe des installations de dessalinisation qui coûtent très cher à l'entreprise, donc ça augmente les coûts d'opération. Et un autre inconvénient, donc c'est euh, euh, les inondations. Malgré que c'est une zone désertique, quand il y a des précipitations extrêmes, donc il y a quand même des inondations qui, qui, ont, qui ont lieu, et l'entreprise a été déjà victime de ces inondations-là. Donc voilà, donc une entreprise donc, qui est vraiment victime de très exposée aux, aux risques physiques. Un secteur aussi qui est exposé aux risques physiques, c'est le secteur des assurances. Euh, parce que chaque fois qu'il y a des dommages, donc c'est les assurances qui payent dans la plupart des cas. Et une étude qui a été faite par le Christian Aid dans un rapport intitulé Counting the Cost to 2020, the Year of Climate Breakdown, a montré que les 10, les 10 événements climatiques les plus coûteux ont coûté aux compagnies d'assurance 150 milliards de dollars. Donc c'est seulement un un actif qui était assuré. Donc, ça, ça montre vraiment les dommages qui, sont, qui ont causé parce qu'il y a beaucoup de compagnies qui n'ont pas d'assurance. Donc, seulement les biens assurés ont été estimés à 150 euh, milliards de dollars. Et ça, c'est juste les 10, mais les 10 euh, événements qui, qui ont été les plus, donc, les plus intenses. Et le dernier exemple que je vais donner, c'est le secteur du pétrole qui, a, qui est exposé aussi bien au risque de transition qu'au risque physique. Donc, euh, pour, par rapport au, à l'accès aux, aux ressources qui est de plus en plus difficile parce que les ressources qui étaient plus accessibles donc, sont presque épuisées. Maintenant, on, on, on a recours à des risques qui sont de plus en plus, en plus difficiles à exploiter, comme les sables bitumineux, le gaz de schiste ou bien le pétrole offshore. C'est dans des zones, des fois, qui sont protégées parce que euh, les ressources qui étaient vraiment disponibles dans des zones facilement accessibles sont, sont épuisées. Donc, ça augmente les coûts d'exploitation et ça augmente aussi les risques liés à l'exploitation et les dépenses qui sont liées à l'exploitation de ces ressources-là. Un autre point, c'est la difficulté d'accès aux assurances parce que beaucoup de compagnies d'assurance maintenant ont en tout cas, mis des restrictions par rapport à l'assurance de compagnies qui sont dans le secteur des énergies fossiles, surtout au niveau du charbon. Si on prend l'exemple, par exemple, d'Allianz, AXA, Susrem, Munich, Zurich, toutes ces compagnies d'assurance-là ont 
euh, des objectifs d'arrêter d'assurer de, de, le secteur du, du, du charbon. Et le troisième risque, donc, c'est le risque d'accès aux finances. Donc, on a vu des carrés des investissements. On a vu beaucoup de banques qui, qui ont arrêté de financer ce secteur. C'est le dernier. C'est le dernier. Hey, Mamadou, thank you. I, I, I have two or three other questions that I wanted to ask. So I wanted to give a little bit of time for some of those other ones. But you've definitely shown us that there are many, many areas where risks um, impact the companies that were invested in around climate change, both in terms of the way they operate and the way the world operates with them. Um, mm -hmm. Both of those instances Uh, create risk uh, as we transition to a society where climate change is a reality. I'm going to skip the second question that we had, and that one had to do with ESG ratings. I'm going to leave that one aside. Mm. And I wonder, could you tell us about some of your experiences around shareholder engagement, both positive and negative? About rating, you mean? ESG rating? No, actually, if you can... Um, Um, well, more with your shareholder engagement um, around yeah, okay. around the okay. um, environmental rating in particular, but um, um, I, I want to hear about um, some of the examples of companies that you've worked with who've been successful in answering uh, shareholders' requests, and in some mm -hmm. cases where companies have not been successful in answering shareholder requests. So I have a, I, I'll begin with the positive uh, uh, experience I have with all the engagement. The first one is that I think that, uh, je voulais tout, je voulais encore en français, ok. <laughs> donc je veux dire que, donc je veux commencer par ce qui est positif, donc ce que j'ai en tout cas retrouvé au niveau de l'engagement actionnarial. J'ai vu que donc ça, ça prend de plus en plus de place au niveau des investisseurs. Parce que quand j'ai commencé dans le domaine en 2007, donc, une bonne partie des investisseurs donc, avaient recours à des ressources externes donc, pour gérer leur, pour gérer leur, leur activité d'engagement. Mais maintenant, de plus en plus, en tout cas, on voit des investisseurs qui ont une équipe ESG sur place, donc, qui gèrent ces risques-là. Donc, euh, qui plus, ça prend de plus en plus de place, en tout cas, au niveau des investisseurs. Et on voit le résultat parce que moi, je vois beaucoup de résultats maintenant positifs au niveau de l'engagement avec ces... Avec ces euh, ces, ces entreprises, je peux donner par exemple l'exemple de Enbridge, donc qui a décidé en tout cas d'avoir un objectif de réduction de d'émissions de gaz à effet de serre grâce à un engagement d'actionnaires comme par exemple le Batirant, le fonds Ferric Exavest. Donc ça c'est une grâce à cette campagne de dialogue, l'entreprise a donc euh, réussi à avoir cet objectif de réduction d'émissions de gaz à effet de serre. Un autre exemple, c'est le cas de Sonovus. Donc, grâce à un engagement de chair, donc ce représentant est là, ils ont aussi donc, décidé en tout cas euh, euh, d'avoir des objectifs de réduction d'émissions de gaz à effet de serre. Et on voit aussi que grâce à l'action de mouvement de défense pour mouvement d'éducation pour la défense des actions de MEDAC qui est au Québec, qui fait beaucoup de campagnes avec les banques, donc des banques comme Bank of Canada. Euh, Canadian Imperial Bank et Toronto Bank ont vu des propositions d'actionner retirées cette année. Donc, ça, ça veut dire qu'il y a des dialogues qui ont abouti, si bien que la proposition a été retirée par, euh, euh, par l'actionnaire. Par et puis, en plus de ces, de, de ces succès au niveau des dialogues et au niveau des propositions retirées, j'ai vu aussi qu'il y a de bons scores en matière de propositions maintenant. Parce que, par exemple, avant 2010, on on était content quand on voyait 40% de votes en faveur des propositions d'actionnaires ou bien 30%. Mais maintenant, on voit des propositions qui dépassent 50%, donc qui obtiennent la majorité au niveau des assemblées des actionnaires. Par exemple, Industrial Alliance, l'année dernière, a eu une proposition d'actionnaire relative au changement climatique, a eu, a eu 74% de votes en faveur. Une autre proposition a eu 61% de votes en faveur. Et puis, on a vu que des propositions aussi ont eu plus de 50% chez Procter Gamble, chez Dollar Tree, chez J.P. Morgan, c'est une proportion liée au changement climatique. Donc, dans ce sens-là, je vois qu'il y a vraiment des progrès qui ont été notés ces dernières années. Maintenant, côté négatif, donc ce que je vois, c'est que euh, puisqu'il y a un succès au niveau de l'engagement actionnarial, il y a de, maintenant des 
ce qu'on appelle des actionnaires, en tout cas, qui ne sont pas conventionnels et qui utilisent l'engagement actionnarial pour faire passer, en tout cas, leurs idées. Par exemple, il y a des propositions des, euh, des gens qui sont contre les la lutte contre les changements climatiques, les efforts que les entreprises font en matière de changement climatique et qui font des propositions d'actionnaires pour les décourager, en tout cas, à investir dans la lutte contre les changements climatiques. Et ils utilisent les mêmes méthodes que les propositions d'actionnaires. Donc ça, si l'actionnaire ne fait pas attention, il peut donc voter en faveur de ces propositions, alors que ce n'est pas en faveur donc, de l'intérêt de l'entreprise. On voit aussi de l'autre côté, donc des ONG, comme par exemple des Greenpeace, Oxfam, les Amis de la Terre, et qui font de plus en plus des propositions d'actionnaires pour, en tout cas, euh, euh, faire savoir aux actionnaires les préoccupations qui les, qui les inquiètent au niveau des, des entreprises. Ça aussi, donc, on sait que leur préoccupation, c'est surtout la défense donc, de l'environnement ou des communautés. Donc, si ce n'est pas équilibré avec l'intérêt financier de l'entreprise, donc ça va compromettre, en tout cas, donc, la performance financière de l'entreprise. Et puis, un autre aspect négatif que j'ai vu aussi, c'est des entreprises qui parlent beaucoup, mais qui ne font pas beaucoup d'efforts. Par exemple, on prend le cas de BlackRock, qui fait beaucoup de déclarations en matière d'engagement, de, mais on, si on voit les votes par rapport aux propositions, propositions liées au changement climatique, elles votent. Il vote peu par rapport aux propositions liées au changement climatique. Donc, globalement, je pense que c'est ça les côtés négatifs que je vois, aussi les côtés négatifs, côtés positifs que je vois au niveau de l'engagement. Je ne sais pas si ça répond à ta question. Oui, je vais devoir. Thank you very much, Mamadou, for your comments. I think uh, we we've used up 20 minutes now, um, so. Um, You've given us a lot to think about. Um, it's it's certainly not an easy path to follow to to move our um, our our economies towards the transition that we need for for a stable future. So this is why conversations like this are very important. We all get to hear the different angles of what's involved in in, in coming up with different kinds of shareholder proposals and the impacts for the companies um, involved. Thank you. And I'm going to move now to. You're welcome. <laughs> it's a lot to cover. There's a, there's <laughs> so much, <laughs> so much. Um, I'm going to share my screen once more and invite Jonathan to uh, do his early part of his presentation. So let's see here. Okay, can you see Jonathan's slides there? I can see my slide, so it looks good. Fantastic. So Hopefully everybody I'll else let can see you it. go with it. You just tell me when to move them ahead. Awesome. Will do. Thanks, Agnes. And hi, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here on behalf of Sustainalytics. Um, so just for maybe these first, um, you know, five to 10 minutes, what I'll do is just a brief introduction of Sustainalytics. And uh, for anyone who's not familiar with ESG ratings, I'll also do a, a little bit of a um, intro to that as well before we get into some, some discussion between Agnes and I. Um, so some of you might know, Sustainalytics is one of the largest providers of ESG research and ratings in the world. Um, our goal is really just to help investors identify, understand, and manage ESG issues. Um, we do that, of course, through our rating products, um, which I'll, I'll talk about a, a bit more. But um, we also have a number of other solutions that we offer in areas like impact, um, engagement, of course, um, compliance, as well as a few other areas. Um, across all of our research, uh, we cover about 20,000 companies. Um, if you can go to the next slide. Uh, so our main rating, um, which is the, the ESG risk rating, um, covers between 13,000 and 14,000 of those 20,000 companies. Um, and it's mainly focused on assessing how a company manages the material ESG issues, or what we call MEIs, um, that it's most exposed to. Um, so it does this first by looking at the industry-specific context, um, and then also looking at company-level risk factors. Um, so that can include differences in where companies operate, um, Canada versus emerging markets, um, their financial performance, um, as well as the specific products and services that they sell. Um, all of these really um, influencing the level of risk that they face. 
Um, we then also look at how are companies actually managing those risks. Um, of course, we look at programs and policies, um, which are largely disclosure based. Um, but we also look at alternative data points. So things like NGO reports, uh, regulatory filings, as well as news coverage. Because um, th those mediums really can indicate issues and controversies that don't make their way, um, you, you know, that don't make their way into corporate disclosure. Uh, next slide. So really quickly, how does uh, the ESG risk rating work and what can it tell you about a company? Um, the first thing that we look at, like I mentioned, is what we call exposure or exposure to risk. Uh, this really just relates to the overall industry that a company operates in, um, which of course will influence what ESG issues uh, it faces. And then also drilling into company specific factors that are really influenced by a company's individual business model. Uh, so an example might be uh, a coal company that produces thermal coal used in electricity production has a really different exposure to transitional risk um, or the risks associated with moving to a low carbon economy um, than a coal company that produces metallurgical coal, uh, which is a type of coal that's used in steel production. Um, and another example might be an oil company that uses fracking to produce oil versus an oil company that uses conventional extraction with fracking obviously being a much more hazardous and much more water intensive types of extraction. Um, after we sort of come up with an exposure value, um, we look at what portion of that exposure to risk is actually manageable. Um, so this relates to the fact that not all risk can be managed by programs and policies and releasing sustainability reports and that type of thing. Um, and this is a, an especially relevant point for oil and gas companies um, where a lot of the risk can only be managed by reducing exposure and transitioning away from fossil fuels. Um, and then lastly, um, we assess, and I mentioned this before, um, we assess how a company manages the exposure that they can address. Um, so that, that looks at programs and policies, the portion that they aren't managing, plus the risks that they're not able to manage because of their business model um, forms what we call the risk rating. Um, and that really provides a signal of um, unmanaged risk or what the company isn't addressing. Um, next slide. So before um, we head into some discussion, I just wanted to highlight um, what some of our research is saying with respect to the industry. Um, so overall, there's been some improvement across uh, the oil and gas industry. Um, it's mainly been related to improvements in disclosure and transparency. So just providing more information and more data. Um, and I will say that the, the sort of baseline for the industry historically has been quite poor. Um, so this improvement isn't necessarily, um, you know, across the entire portfolio isn't, isn't the best. Um, but what's most relevant and I think is, is, most, uh, is most interesting to investors is from the perspective of exposure to risk. And you can see some of our data on the slide. Um, business models really haven't been changing in any substantial way, um, which really means that risk continues to be quite high and risk in the future um, is likely to continue being high. Um, lastly, um, when it comes to, to revenue generation, which is really an important indicator of um, our companies transitioning, um, fossil fuel derived revenue, especially in the Canadian context, um, continues to be quite high. Um, even in the best cases, which are primarily out of the European Union, um, most companies um, you know, are really continuing to derive most of their revenue from um, oil and gas, and there's still a lot of new investments going into new exploration and uh, new production. Uh, and then maybe a last note, and I'm sure we'll get into this a little bit more in our discussion. Um, some of the things that are impacting the industry right now that are quite interesting, beyond just the general misalignment of capital spending, 
um, are other issues like uh, climate related litigation against oil and gas companies um, that's especially relevant in the US um, in, uh, in states where the physical impacts of climate change are beginning to be felt. Um, and then looking at uh, the risk of stranded assets. Um, so that's primarily concerned with the price environment for oil and gas. Um, where new new investments may not generate, um, you know, may not generate a return in the future. Um, and then lastly, some of the lobbying activity that we've been seeing, which is uh, really contradicting a lot of the commitments that um, that uh, oil and gas companies are, are are starting to make, especially in Canada. Um, so that, that ends my little intro um, and happy to move over to some uh, discussion questions with you, Agnes. I think you might be on mute. Agnes, you are muted. Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> I just wanted to show Jonathan's uh, disclaimer slide there, and it's, it's just, it was up a few seconds, so if people can look at it closer again in the um, in the recording. But um, thank you, Jonathan. We have about ten minutes for questions. So uh, my first one um, at GCC in Canada, we are very concerned about the ESG performance of the energy sector. Uh, and you did address some of this in your introductory remarks, but for investors planning future direction of their shareholder advocacy or um, looking at their asset allocations again, can you help us understand the obvious global trends that will affect the type and severity of risks in this sector? Yeah, sure. I can, I can talk about a few of them. Um, obviously, there's, a, there's an abundance of trends and risks for the sector. Um, they're, in, they're in no short supply. Um, one of them, I think, that was that was brought up by Mamadou, that's quite quite interesting, uh, and we're seeing a lot of this sort of come up in the rating space. Um, our policy changes in the United States, um, and that's that's especially relevant for Canadian producers, since the majority of Canadian oil um, is sent to the U.S. to be refined. Um, so when you're looking at policy changes that are impacting the development of infrastructure, like the Keystone XL pipeline or line five, which Enbridge is trying to, to expand or trying, trying, trying to revamp, um, or the line three replacement project, which is another Enbridge product, project. Um, policy changes that impact these types of things all have a cost impact on Canadian producers. Um, so obviously pipelines tend to be the cheapest way to get oil to market. Um, but because of the climate concerns and because of the, the sustainability agenda of the, the new U.S. administration, um, we're seeing a lot of the risks actually being taken on by the Canadian producers. Um, so I think that's a, that's a really important trend, and especially with the new commitments that the U.S. has been making and uh, sort of their, their plan for their, their energy landscape, um, the U.S.-Canada relationship um, will likely be impacted, and that's going to impact um, investments into, into the Canadian energy space. Um, another thing that I think is quite relevant um, is actually what the, um, what the oil and gas industry is doing to address transitional risk, so risks associated with the movement away from oil and gas products. Um, a number of companies, um, especially in the U.S., but in Canada as well, I've been trying to hedge against demand decrease for oil and gas by moving over to petrochemicals. Um, so feedstocks that eventually go into, into plastics. Um, from a carbon perspective, um, it's really not addressing a lot of the risk um, since manufacturing petrochemicals is still carbon intensive. Um, it's merely trying to address some of the business risk. Um, but with petrochemical production, um, you really are, you're taking on a number of other issues. Um, so issues relating to localized air pollution, um, which is a very, very serious issue, especially in the Southern US. There's a number of large chemical projects coming up um, that are having um, predominantly negative impacts on racial, racialized communities or communities of color. Um, 
a lot of issues around uh, water pollution and groundwater contamination. Um, so, you know, in terms of responding to the transition, you're seeing a lot of companies saying, we're moving to more resilient products, petrochemicals, um, but uh, you know, that's not, a, that's not a solution because it does come with, with its own risks. And I think uh, the more companies shift over to this model, um, you know, we're gonna see these types of risk um, increase quite a bit more. And then, and then the last um, trend I'll, I'll touch on very briefly um, is actually the move is is a movement away from um, working at home and uh, working in develop or developing markets. Um, so Mamadou had mentioned a number of projects in Africa, um, and I think that's that's a very um, common trend in the oil and gas industry. Um, and those projects tend to be executed in an environment where the regulatory protections or even the community protections are, are not quite as strong. And there's a real potential for companies to take advantage of that. Um, so that creates a very real risk in terms of um, how individuals can be impacted by, by projects in emerging markets. Um, a good example, um, so a, a French company, Total, is building a pipeline between Uganda and Tanzania um, and that, that pipeline is actually facing a lot of um, not only public backlash, but financing backlash because of its potential impact in displacing individuals and entire communities. So, you know, to sort of respond to the, the more significant changes in these, you know, in places like Canada, US, Western Europe, where, you know, it's becoming a little bit more hostile, um, I think a lot of companies are looking at these emerging markets. Um, where the impacts can still be quite, quite negative. So from an investor perspective, really looking at corporate conduct around the world, I think will be very important. Can I jump in, Agnes, it's Lucy. Um, uh, Jonathan, a quick clarification question. What is the X access on your last graph? Uh, hold on, let me, the X axis. Uh, okay, so so um, x axis is just the distribution of risk. Um, so sort of like left, when you're looking at left to right, left is lower risk or lower exposure, right is high risk. And then when you're looking at those percentages, that's just the percentage of companies in our research um, universe. So like, um, when you're looking at uh, that 50% in the graph on the left, that's saying that 50% of oil and gas producers are at the highest risk exposure category. Um, so left to right, exposure and risk, and up and down, just sort of the, the overall proportion of companies that we cover. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, right, no problem. Um, I think we only have time for one more question. Um, Let's see. Um, I'm going to sort of smush two questions together. Um, how do corporate lobbying activities and the continued investment in the um, developing fossil fuels undermine the efforts of what investors uh, are looking for and what they should be wary of? And um, how can investors overcome these issues? Yeah. So. A lot of the commitments, especially coming um, from Canadian oil and gas companies, actually aren't addressing the full spectrum of emissions. So most of the targets and most of the um, most of the initiatives to deal with emissions are primarily focused on scope one emissions and scope two emissions. So emissions that are directly released from business activities and emissions associated with purchased electricity. Um, that doesn't account for emissions that are associated with the actual use of oil and gas products, um, what we call scope three. Um, so when you're looking at um, sort of um, what investors should be wary of, um, especially with respect to the continued development of fossil fuels, looking at sort of targets that are, that are focused on these areas um, is, is really important because 
the impact will continue to go up the more that you invest in in sort of greenfield oil and gas uh, projects. Um, so, you know, and, and that's why we see the industry tends to focus on carbon intensity rather than actual absolute carbon that's released um, is because you can get pretty efficient in terms of, um, you know, reducing emissions per barrel. But when you're just exploring and developing new fields all the time, your bar is actually going up with respect to how much carbon you're releasing. And then um, really quickly on the corporate lobbying um, side of things. Um, so there's a real inconsistency between the targets and commitments and statements that are coming out from a lot of the companies um, in Canada, as well as the US, um, the EU is doing a little bit better. Um, but there's a, there's a real inconsistency. Um, I think what, what investors need to be wary of is um, statements from companies where they're saying they don't engage in lobbying activity or they don't lobby against regulations, but their membership in industry associations um, says the opposite. Um, so, you know, looking at the lobbying activity of these main oil and gas associations, um, so in Canada, Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers is one of the big ones. Looking at if there's a conflict between what they're saying they believe in and then what the, their memberships um, and those organizations are saying, I think that's, that's an area that uh, investors need to be wary of. <laughs> I will remember this time to unmute myself. Thank you, Jonathan, very much. Um, again, so much to think about, but you've helped us put a, a Canadian perspective on, on um, the energy sector in particular. And I know that our, our investments are concerned with more than just energy, but that is, is something that um, uh, definitely merits conversation again. Um, I'm going to now begin with my questions for Anthony. And Anthony is from uh, SHARE. Anthony, how does SHARE's faith groups, uh, sorry, how does SHARE assist faith groups in seeking to influence the companies in which they're invested? And are there restrictions to engagement based on the amount of funds that you have to invest? Sure, thanks. Uh, thanks so much uh, for having me today, Agnes, and, and thanks to uh, Jonathan and Mamadou as well for their comments. Um, so uh, I'll, I'll get to that. I just before uh, before I lose it, uh, just because it's the, the the point that Jonathan wrapped up on, uh, I just want to emphasize because it's been a, an important piece of of Share's own work uh, around climate lobbying. Uh, we've seen so many examples, as, as Jonathan was was just uh, mentioning, uh, of companies that take a you know a public position. Uh, for example, supporting the the, uh, the the Paris Agreement, but then you know spend uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of dollars uh, on industry associations that that go out and lobby against those very same issues. Uh, so uh, it is a really critical uh, area. It's a, a, a key part of our work at Share, both in Canada and in the U.S. Uh, and I'll come back a bit more to it, but just because it was on point there, we published a. a, a first ever Canadian benchmark of uh, climate lobbying activity just last fall. My colleague, Sarah, who was on last week's panel, uh, undertook this, uh, this research. Um, and so I've shared the link to that in, in the chat here and we'll, publish, we'll be publishing an update uh, of that report uh, in, the, um, in the fall of this year. So uh, just because it was timely, I'll, I wanted to mention that. But yeah, so um, uh, to get to your, to your question a bit more, um, you know, Share has a really long history of working with, with religious investors. Uh, in fact, really our roots are in, uh, are in part in uh, the task force uh, on churches and corporate responsibility, uh, which is probably a, a task force and, and uh, organizing effort that some of the participants today are familiar with. So we sort of owe the, 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 the religious responsible investor community uh, part of our birthright at Share, uh, along with some, some trade, trade unionists who were uh, very adamant on the opportunity and the, um, the possibilities that come from uh, investor uh, advocacy. So that's really where our roots are in a lot of ways. Um, and we, we know in, in, uh, in, in uh, establishing our programs and in all the work that we do, that oftentimes many forms of responsible investment, uh, and particularly around engagement, uh, are, are kind of out of reach for small and, and medium-sized investors, uh, particularly, you know, probably for some of the funds of the size uh, that, that folks on today's call are. Uh, you know, if you are 
a multi-billion dollar um, pension plan, you likely have the ability to have, you know, uh, in-house ESG advisors and uh, and a whole host of, of staff support. But if you're re representing a fund of, you know, five or $10 million, uh, you might not have any staff support at all. Um, so participants in our program uh, range from, from the, the you know, what's quite, still a lot of money to me, uh, but on the uh, on the institutional investor side of things, a pretty small group, uh, you know, as, as small as three or, or four million dollars, uh, up to, uh, you know, some some larger pension funds in the uh, in the tens of billions. Um, but many of our religious investors are, are uh, in fact, most of our religious investors are at that smaller end of things. And our program is really designed to be quite uh, accessible in terms of our engagement and in terms of, uh, of all the different ways that we uh, try and bring people to together. Um, and, you know, our program is really designed around a pretty old fashioned concept, um, cooperation, uh, which is uh, really the, uh, the kind of kindergarten idea that we can bring together, uh, uh, you know, bring together many to, to have uh, a positive impact through that kind of engagement, kind of uh, collaboration and cooperation. Um, so our program is built each year to engage a, a broad range of Canadian, US and global companies uh, on, uh, on a, a cross section of issues. Um, and for, for smaller investors, you know, only a subset of the companies we engage will show up in their, in their reports and will be part of their own individual engagement activities as, as, uh, as individual asset owners. Uh, so last year in Canada, or excuse me, in, in globally, we uh, engaged with about 120 companies overall um, on uh, 200, more than 200 different engagements. So the numbers don't quite add up there because sometimes we would engage one company on two or three issues. So each of those counts as a separate engagement. Um, so if you're a smaller investor, you might only have uh, you know, 10, 20, 30 of those companies in your portfolio. So your report uh, will be a little bit smaller, but your impact is, is still the same. Um, and and Absolutely, you know the, the program is designed. The engagement program, in particular, is designed to uh, to support investors that don't have a lot of resources, that don't have uh, in-house staff teams, uh, for example. But they're also designed in a way uh, that uh, any of our participants can get active and can uh, can be really full participants. So, uh, you know, one of our most active participants that, in fact, I think this year filed uh, five or maybe even six shareholder proposals uh, is the. Um, uh, Institute of the Blessed Virgin Mary Foundation of Canada, uh, and then uh, the Catherine Donnelly Foundation, which is a sponsor of uh, of today's session, uh, also relatively small on on in the scope of uh, of the institutional investor world, uh, filed three more uh, proposals in this in this current uh, year. So you know, size isn't an uh, obstacle to being a really active participant. In both of those cases, the the IBVM uh, and Catherine Donnelly. They, they're really motivated by our work. Uh, in fact, they're, they're also very, um, very passionate in, in sharing the experience of working with us. And, and we love that uh, because it, it, you know, it, I think for both of those organizations, it's been really rewarding for, for them, not just in uh, aligning their investments with their values, but also in terms of building up their capacity and, and, and giving some, um, some learning opportunities to, uh, to their uh, staff and their, their leadership teams. So absolutely, size is not uh, not a an obstacle. We predominantly work uh, among the religious investors. We work with predominantly with uh, with Catholic and and um, uh, and Protestant groups, but we certainly uh, have have uh, in our network uh, a number of different faith faith groups, and and certainly would love to to work more on an interfaith basis. Uh, and certainly, I know from my own experience uh, in in political life uh, that the kind of interfaith. Uh, advocacy can be incredibly uh, powerful when when religious groups come together. Um, of course, when you come together within your uh, denomination, that's very powerful. And when you come together between denominations, that can be even more powerful. I was lucky enough to be part of an interfaith effort in uh, 2013, 2014 here in Toronto uh, to stop the mega casino that was planned for the uh, downtown right outside of the CN Tower. Uh, and there were a lot of things that helped to stop that casino from being built um, by um, now our premier, Doug Ford, then a member of council. Uh, but one of the one of the key key points of that campaign was when uh, a really broad range of, uh, of faith leaders uh, came out and and, uh, and spoke against the, the the mega casino. It was really kind of a turning point in that effort. So I uh, would love to, to have more to bring in folks from from different uh, different faith groups. Um, in terms of the level of involvement and the, the different ways to to get involved. I've been speaking so far primarily to our engagement program and, and uh, that's 
that's the program I lead and, and it's where I think there's the most opportunity. Uh, but we also have, uh, have some easy entry kind of uh, first steps that are uh, straightforward for investors to take. Uh, one of them is to be an affiliate of SHARE uh, and that's, that's a very um, modest fee that we charge. It's $500 for most funds. Uh, and it includes some consulting time, uh, uh, complimentary consulting time as well as discounts on our educational programs uh, each year. Less of an issue when we're doing everything virtually because we've charged very low or no fees. But in uh, normal times, which uh, uh, I think we all can hope and uh, and pray if that's our um, if that's our way or coming back soon, uh, we we do have uh, in-person educational sessions and we offer a discount on that to affiliate members. Um, the second sort of easy place to get started is through what we call our proxy audit tool, uh, and that is really exactly what it sounds like, which is that um, my colleagues will will review the the your portfolio and the, the companies you own shares of uh, and how your asset manager um, uh, voted on various uh, shareholder proposals and and uh, and other ballot items in the previous year and you know we'll we'll review how how those votes aligned with a sort of ESG um, lens uh, and we can then make some recommendations about how to to maybe be a bit more uh, in control when that's when that's appropriate in control of your uh, of your voting uh, or just you know uh, help you to have a conversation with your asset manager about about your own values um so that's uh, that's sort of what i what i wanted to speak to in, in your first question i guess i think uh if i could just sum up in in one short piece though it's that uh, there is a lot of opportunity uh for uh, small medium-sized investors to to make a difference through engagement uh, I've only been at Share for a little over a year now, uh, so I'm still pretty excitable about these things. But uh, but the reason for that is that I do see this this uh, uh, tremendous opportunity that that's available when investors uh, come together uh, and and sort of uh, flex their flex their muscle uh, through uh, through shareholder engagement and, and other means. I know it sounds like I'm just trying to convince you of how great Share is. Um, I think it's great when you do that, no matter who you who you participate with. Uh, but certainly, uh, you know more than welcome to, uh, to to work with Cher as well. Well, it has, that's actually a great lead into to some of the other the other question that I want to ask. Some of our um, our participants and people who are following this um, Equal Investment Accelerator project are part of post-secondary institutions or are um, part of uh, other larger groups. And I know that Cher has um, created <clears throat> excuse me, created avenues for different types of groups to network and work together. Um, could you tell us a little bit about the, the university initiative and give us an introduction to um, the Responsible Reconciliation Investment Initiative? Next week, we'll have someone elaborating on that more, but these are two, and maybe there are others that um, Cher is helping to facilitate conversations across um, different sets of investors. Yeah, happy happy to. Um, so you know, as I as I mentioned um, uh, earlier, you know, share is really built on the, the the power of cooperation and collaboration, and that's really in our in our DNA, so to speak. Um, and I think so. We kind of all see in the, in the way we think about our work at share that you know each of us individually uh, might be you know too small, too weak, uh, have too many time pressures to to be able to to make a difference. Um, but that that there is you know tremendous uh, power when we can come together through some collective action. Uh, I think for people of faith, that's probably a pretty easy concept. Uh, we know that uh, you know I'll spare you having to hear me sing by myself. Uh, we know how that can sound um, and how scary that can can be. Certainly, it makes my uh, my heart beat a little faster to think about having to um, to sing by myself. Uh, but we also know that uh, when a whole congregation or a choir sings together, it, it's it's incredibly powerful. So the networks that Share has built. Um, are really designed to uh, to give groups of investors the opportunity to grow and learn from each other, uh, and to take that strength in in being together. Uh, so we want uh, we want uh, everybody to who participates in our programs to have the feeling of singing in the congregation, not uh, not by themselves. So hopefully your your heart can beat a bit more uh, naturally. Um, so one of the one of those networks is uh, is the one that that you mentioned. Agnes is called the Resp uh, Reconciliation and Responsible Investment Initiative, or RRII, uh, and that's a program that has sort of two components to it. Uh, one is to uh, build up investor knowledge and capacity uh, around uh, around Indigenous rights and reconciliation, and so that. Uh, um, reconciliation is a central piece of, of our engagement program. Uh, in fact, you know we 
we have uh, a, a separate a, a section of our program that's that's really designed around reconciliation and we had one really recent um, success I'm quite proud of in that space I'll, I'll hopefully have time to come back to it at the end um, so that's part one of that program is is um, building up and, and promoting reconciliation as an investor issue uh, and, and building investor awareness on that. And we've been at that for about three or four years now. And I think, uh, you know, it's a it's becoming a mainstream issue for Canadian investors to uh, to recognize the need to integrate um, Indigenous rights into their into their thinking. The second part of that is the is the more network part. Uh, and uh, in the same way that uh, that um, religious investors might feel alone or that uh, university investors might feel alone uh, or that uh, other groups of investors might feel alone. Uh, the same is true for, ha has been true for Indigenous investors who, you know, um, uh, may not be, or are almost always doing this on a part-time basis and may not have, uh, you know, a huge amount of, uh, of institutional support or staff support uh, in their roles as trustees. And, you know, I think oftentimes this is like a, a pretty universal story that uh, a new trustee comes into a, a committee meeting or a board meeting and says, you know, I'd really like to talk about uh, an ESG issue or, or a, a values issue. Um, and, you know, the others in the room, particularly the, uh, the you know, the, uh, the folks from maybe their uh, um, bank advisor or, or their uh, asset manager say, well, that's nice, but we can't really talk about uh, values or ESG at the boardroom table. That's, that's, not, that, that's not where this conversation belongs. So, pat you on the head and, and dismiss you. Uh, and so for, uh, for the network piece of our work, it's really about um, empowering individual trustees uh, to, to be at the table uh, and, um, and engage in that conversation to say, actually, that's not true. This is the place to have this conversation. Of course, in a, you know, in a respectful way and recognizing what's on the agenda uh, for today, but absolutely, you know, my fiduciary duty uh, is not in conflict with my, um, with my values, and, and this is the place to, to do it. That's why I'm here. Uh, so, for Indigenous investors, we 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 want to bring uh, bring folks together to to have those uh, have those uh, discussions and you know amongst themselves, build up those skills. So that's the part B of the RRII. The university network you, you mentioned uh, as well. So I'll speak to it in a bit of detail too. Um, it's similar and different. So definitely similar in that sense of uh, of wanting to to um, uh, provide trustees and, and uh, fiduciaries, decision makers, with the the tools and the uh, the tools and, and sometimes sometimes just the talking points when they get around the table and somebody says, you know, this isn't the right, you're in the wrong venue to talk about ESG or to talk about values. We want to make sure that they have the support to do that. Um, but in the university's case, it's designed a little bit different because we actually uh, were able to to design a, a, a standalone engagement program for a group of universities to, to work together. Uh, and it's focused exclusively on climate. Um, and, uh, and it currently involves 11 Canadian universities with about $11 billion in assets. Um, pretty much all of the, the biggest universities in Canada are now participants. And so we, we uh, oversee an engagement program uh, that's sort of a, uh, an, uh, it's a, there's some overlap, but it's separate from our overall engagement program at SHARE. Uh, we just kicked that off uh, in February. So there's still uh, there's still lots to, to get going on uh, and more universities uh, joining us all the time. So very excited about the, the potential uh, direction for that. But really the, the main, fo so main focus of uni is to, uh, to be able to uh, present to Canadian companies uh, and US companies a sort of united uh, group of uh, of really uh, influential Canadian investors with uh, with a view of what uh, what the climate crisis looks like and how those companies can uh, address it. We also have some other smaller networks that um, that I'll just very briefly mention. Um, one just, uh, just one minute. Oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> oh sorry. I'll mention them in one minute. Sorry, I thought you were uh, you wanted me to pause for one minute. Um, very briefly, we have we we have a, a, a similar network for trade union uh, representatives called the Canadian uh, Capital Stewardship Network. Uh, so same idea. And then finally, we do uh, we do have a religious investors network as well, and we offer a uh, usually a, an in person conference uh, and training session every fall. Last year, it was a series of webinars online. And we'll see what happens this uh, coming year. Uh, and we we offer a, you know a mailing list and, and some opportunities for religious investors to uh, to connect through that through that opportunity. Great, thank you. So there 
there are tools here that we can use through SHARE. And I think there is a, a similar organization in, in Quebec um, that Mamadou had been part of uh, a couple of years ago. Um, thank you. Thank you to all of our speakers. I'm going to now um, turn things over to Lucy, who's been watching our chat box. Lucy, we have about 18 minutes to answer some of the fabulous questions that have been coming in. Yeah, I have a tough job, I have to say. They're great questions, so I'll do the best I can to kind of collate some of these questions. Um, so the first question is for all the panelists, and, um, and I think I'll give you each a part of this question. So the, the basic question is, Mamadou, um, you, you uh, laid out very clearly all the financial and reputational and legal risks that companies are facing with regard to climate but we still see increasing fossil fuel investment. Um, why is that? And then the part B of this question is looking specifically at Canadian banks. Um, Jonathan, this might be a question for you. Why specifically do we see Canadian banks investing when they're famous for um, being kind of balanced uh, investors? And then Anthony, the last part of this question is, are there examples of faith communities uh, withdrawing uh, investments for, from, uh, from, com from companies uh, who are doing this? So uh, um, Mamadou, maybe start with you. Why um, are companies ignoring the risk and, and continuing to invest? Yes, thank you for the question. I think it's very interesting. So I think that uh, if you see again, uh, some companies are still investing in fossil fuel is because uh, the transition had to, is to be uh, to be done uh, gradually. We can a company can't, for example, depend on oil and oil and uh, uh, the, and one day shift to renewable. It's not possible. So we'll continue to see uh, oil and gas and uh, for the next. Uh, next years, but what is important is that uh, the company knows that it has to abandon the fossil 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 fuel and gradually meet, uh, move to renewable energy. So it has to first leave the most pollu pollu pollutant uh, fossil fuel like coal. After that, it's oil, and after that, natural gas, and after that, uh, renewable. But you can't just shift from fossil fuel to renewable because uh, the quantity of renewable energy that is existing now can't provide sufficient energy to the world. So we need to do the transition uh, gradually. So the investors have to be careful to see, uh, make sure that the company understands this. So because it depends on the policy of the investors. There's some of them doesn't want any risk, take any risk, and they just divest from fossil fuel, fossil fuel, fuel uh, companies. But most of them, they want to engage with the company to make sure that the company understands this and makes its operation clean and, and responsible. So it depends on the policies and the, capac the, the, ex the capacity of the investor to accept some certain risk or, or not. But it's, I think that it's not too wise to tell a, a company that depends 100% on oil to sell, to tell him to just move uh, next year to, 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 to renewable. So it's hard to be done gradually. Thank you. Um, Jonathan, do you want to um, talk about Canadian banks in this regard? Yeah, sure. So, so I think it's um, as John V had put it, they are major financers of oil and gas. Um, you know, as good of a risk managers as our Canadian bank, our Canadian banks are. Um, I think, unfortunately, there's a there's a comfort in investing in the Canadian oil and gas sector. Um, I think I think one of the the key points, and and Mamadou had mentioned this before or in his reply, is that there is a pecking order when it comes to um, either divestment or sort of the the reduction of investment. And we've seen that start for Canadian Canadian banks. Um, so last far last fall, RBC decided to stop financing Arctic oil um, or Arctic drilling, um, which is obviously a, a high cost, high risk type of drilling. 
Um, and that's usually when you look at sort of major, major banks or major institutional investors, I think that's, that's usually the approach that they take is, is exiting the highest risk and the highest impact types of production first. Um, I think one of the reasons that we're seeing investments perpetuate for Canadian banks is that the environment in Canada and the environment in Alberta um, is still quite hospitable for a lot of oil and gas companies, um, especially when you think of uh, subsidies and sort of government aid. Um, I think it, it makes the case of investing a little bit easier and a little bit safer. Um, so I think as a, as the broader political or broader policy environment changing changes, um, I don't think it's going to be as safe. Um, so I think we're going to see we're going to see more action in terms of um, divestments or decision to to divest. Um, and Anthony, I guess the last question, the last part is for you. Um, have, is, are there religious institutions that have withdrawn investments, and do you all ever rec recommend divestment? In these cases, yeah. Um, so that's a, a great question, and, and I think divestment is often a tool that uh, that you know is uh, is easily recognized as as available to uh, to a group of investors. I would tend to um, you know usually think about uh, about this on sort of a spectrum of um, of actions, and for us, we we tend to see divestment as a, an outcome that uh, you know that may make sense. For, for investors who have not been able to see progress uh, over time with, with a company. Uh, and so, you know, we don't, we don't make investment recommendations at ShareLink. We don't say buy or sell or anything like that. So I wouldn't say that I have ever recommended, I, I know that I've never recommended to a, to a client, you should, you know, you should divest from this, this company. But what we do say is, you know, we've been engaging with, uh, with um, you know, Acme Inc for the last uh, six years and uh, they repeatedly, uh, blow us off, and, and they you know they, they never are responsive, and they're uh, they haven't set targets, and when they have set targets, they've they've missed them. Uh, so you know, it's up to you what you, what you want to do with that information. Um, but uh, in general, as a starting point, you know we see uh, we we don't see a lot of value in uh, in taking your your cards and and folding them up and walking away from the table at the very start. Uh, so I tend to see divestment as uh, as a uh, as part of an escalation strategy, uh, as something that is is a, a possible outcome, um, but uh, but not certainly not where we would start. So for us, so we have a sort of a model of what that uh, escalation would look like. But certainly starting with you know starting with some initial dialogue, uh, may, maybe moving on to um, a shareholder proposal or uh, or bringing additional investors together for that dialogue. Uh, so with some companies that are a bit intransigent, uh, you know we participate in. Uh, there's one company we're engaged with uh, where I think there's 40 different asset owners around the table. Um, not, that's not always the most effective, but in this case, it seems to be working. It certainly helps the company to, to focus a bit. Um, so that's one part of an escalation. A second one might be, as I said, uh, to, to file a shareholder proposal um, and companies are quite responsive, particularly Canadian companies are quite responsive to that. Uh, and then, you know, uh, a next step might be to, to recommend a vote against um, uh, one or more members of the board. So this year, for example, uh, we're recommending uh, investors vote against uh, the, the chair of the board at Chartwell, the retirement uh, operator, a uh, fellow named Michael Harris, former premier of Ontario. Um, and so we actually have a shareholder proposal there as well as a vote recommendation. And that is certainly part of an escalation strategy. Um, but it, it kind of, uh, it, it did kind of uh, uh, break my heart a little bit and it's a very serious topic. So I, I don't mean to say that lightly, but uh, we had one client who, when I went to file that shareholder proposal at Chartwell, um, which was filed by the, the Loretto sisters, the IBVM uh, in this case as well. Uh, anyway, I went to approach a different client about, about filing that proposal. This was back in November, December of last year. Um, and I wrote to her and I said, you know, you've, you've, you clearly have an issue, interest in this issue. Uh, this is what we want to do. Would you like to file? Um, and, uh, and she said, oh, you know, I would love to, but I read your comments about uh, about Chartwell uh, in the last newsletter, or last uh, report, uh, all of the ways that they're that they're not meeting investor expectations around human capital and and you know the workplace conditions, the the care conditions. So I sold all my shares, um, and that was the part that just oh, I mean, I totally understand, and that's I'm glad that somebody's using uh, our uh, our work and our advice to inform their investment decisions. But in that case, I thought, 
I wish you'd just held on to them so that we could have uh, we could have filed on your behalf and actually having you be able to say hey, I I chose the proposal instead of selling uh, you know might might have been uh, helpful. We were able to pr proceed anyway, but that's to me that's just an example of why you know making that divest like rushing to divestment isn't always the the, the best strategy. Just one last point point on divestment uh, that I do think is important, um, which is that you know when when we look at the the highest emitting companies in Can in Canada. Uh, it's pretty easy, relatively easy to say, okay, well, you know, well, we don't want to hold, uh, you know, pure oil and gas companies. That's like easy to say, these are high emitting companies and we can get them out of our portfolios. Um, and, you know, that that's obviously, again, I don't give investment advice, so that, that may or may not be the, the right choice for you. But when you go a layer down uh, in terms of where the biggest climate impacts are coming from, so, you, you know, you've got some oil and gas, but pretty quickly you hit banking, okay, so you're not going to hold any of the big Canadian banks. And then transportation and 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 agriculture. Uh, so once you've kind of taken uh, taken and then retail, uh, taken like Loblaw out of your portfolio and Metro uh, as big big agriculture and food supply and transportation companies, uh, and you got rid of the banks from your portfolio, it, it is kind of hard to to think about uh, investing in the Canadian economy. And so uh, just to close off, I, I wanted to um, to come back to to a comment Mamadou made at the start, which was about how the impacts of uh, of certain kinds of, uh, you know, resource intensive projects are, are really being felt more, uh, more overseas in terms of, uh, you know, uh, social standards that might be there. And I think for, for all of us, that is really important to keep in mind, like what are the, uh, the knock on effects of, uh, of making a choice to, to divest. Uh, and to me, one thing that, that does, um, uh, you know, does scare me a little bit is to see investors Divesting from Canadian firms, and that's fine. If that's what you want to do, that's that's fine. But then exclusively investing, or almost exclusively investing uh, overseas, without you know recognizing the the need to invest in Canada as part of a just transition, uh, as well as not necessarily taking into account what the uh, related ESG issues might be in that uh, that overseas project that they're working on. It's not to say there's not lots of great overseas projects that that you should be part of, but uh, but I just you know think you can't take those things in isolation. Great, thank you so much, Anthony. Um, Jonathan, a question for you. Um, there are so many different ESG metrics. Um, you presented uh, uh, Sustainalytics, but um, there are different credentialing organizations. They're looking at different things. We, we had a specific question about water, for example. So how do you make sense of it as a responsible shareholder? How do you pick and choose um, which uh, metrics are the best? Yeah, sure. Um, I can I can definitely comment on that. Um, we hear a lot of that from a, from our perspective as a rating provider, because um, there are so many ratings out there. Um, so so I guess I'll, I'll start with um, with the rating side and then drill down to individual metrics. Um, from the rating perspective, um, there are differences in how rating providers view companies. Um, so Sustainalytics may say high risk for Chevron, while an MSCI, which is you know one of the other main ones, might say severe. Um, those differences aren't they're not related to a right and wrong type of situation where you know one is right and one is wrong. It's really just a difference in a in sort of methodology um, and, and and a focus. Um, so I think when investors are sort of when they're seeking um, products or they're seeking uh, investment services or, or data, they need to look at the data or services that align most closely with their investment thesis or with their view um, and should align to sort of those types of products. Um, when, when you're thinking about the actual metrics, um, so you know, what metrics should we look at when we assess the carbon performance of a company? Um, that's tough, um, especially if you're you're an investor with a, a diversified portfolio, which you know pretty much all investors are. Because um, right right now the corporate disclosure environment is very industry specific, so oil and gas companies are disclosing disclosing carbon per barrel, and then you might get a mining company doing carbon per ton, um, and it you know and that's not comparable. Um, so there's been some push to sort of come up with um, disclosure standards, and that's sort of slow. I mean, it's more in the the ballpark of the the regulators, yes, but sort of the the standard setters as as well. Um, looking for metrics that are as comparable as possible 
is really your best bet. Um, so at Sustainalytics, like when we assess carbon, um, we look at carbon per revenue. And because we're using revenue as a denominator, it's at least comparable across sectors. Um, so you can have something where you're saying, you know what, Suncor is disco disclosing this and you've got a PetroChina or you've got a company, um, you know, across seas, they're disclosing this. If you're looking at rev carbon per revenue, you're at least able to sort of, you know, compare it in a way that makes sense. Um, so when it comes to metrics, yeah, really focusing on on sort of variables that are at least comparable in some way um, so that you can have information that makes sense across the portfolio. Great. Agnes, can I do one last question? Sorry, you're on Sorry. mute. Two, two minutes. So um, this is a question for all of you, but I'm going to put uh, Mamadou on the spot. Um, and it's basically around the urgency uh, of climate. And we all know that we don't have time. Um, so do uh, isn't drastic action necessary? Uh, Mamadou, should we all be taking to the streets? Forget about cooperation and corporate handholding. Should we just be backing strong, drastic uh, action? And as Joe Gunn has said, um, head to the streets. I, I think that it depends on uh, the, 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 the stakeholders because I think that uh, some, some of companies are, are listening because we have, I think uh, recently we have seen a lot of improvement regarding emission reductions and adaptation measures. We have, for example, the, uh, in Africa, a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of bank, for example, have accreditation to the, to the Green Climate Fund, fund and they are, they are funding a lot of projects uh, that contribute to the fight against the climate change. And I think that a lot of investors are doing effort to uh, reduce or to avoid uh, uh, companies that uh, that that are uh, that have bad bad practice. So I think that uh, we can to put all all of them in the same in the same <laughs> in the same package. So I think that we have to uh, to congratulate companies that are doing effort, that are uh, uh, listening, that are collaborating with investors through dialogues, because we have. A lot of well, a lot of proposals that are withdrawn because companies want uh, accept to collaborate. We have a lot of successful dialogue. So for companies that are cooperating, I think that we should uh, congratulate them and encourage them to continue in this way. But companies that are don't don't to listen, I think we have to use the uh, the tough the tough method and engage uh, strongly with them. So, <laughs> but not put all of them in the same in the same. <laughs> place. <laughs> Great. Thank you all very much. Thank you. There, there okay. is so much to consider. And um, um, I hope each of the speakers, Mamadou, uh, Jonathan, and Anthony, don't mind if I get in touch with you afterwards and, and, and chat maybe once or twice more to capture things that are um, brought up in the, in the question box that maybe we didn't get a chance to answer today. Um, I'm going to share my screen once more. Uh, can everyone see that? Okay. Um, I want to make sure that you are aware that there are two more uh, sessions in this series. Next week, we'll be talking about Indigenous and impact investing. Uh, if you haven't registered, you can visit our website at faithinthecommongood.org backslash Canada. GCCM Canada webinars, and you can um, sign up for the last two. Uh, I also want to let you know that there are uh, several organizations who have already um, thought deeply uh, about the, some of the things that we're talking about. And if any participants on our webinars would like to partner with these organizations, the Catherine Donnelly Foundation, Jesuits of Canada, Sisters of Notre Dame, Caritas Canada, um, and, and the others there in Scarborough Missions. Um, please reach out to us at our email and we will pair you up so that um, we can continue these discussions and move forward with our uh, investment strategies um, with the help of 
some who have done this work already. Um, this is a, a service that we want to offer through the uh, Catholic Eco Investment Accelerator. So I encourage you to um, think about that and reach out to us if you are interested. Um, finally, this is some contact information for the Global Catholic Climate Movement in Canada and our um, uh, parent organization, Faith in the Common Good. Um, lastly, I have a lot of people to thank. I'm not going to thank them all, but primarily, first and foremost, are the Catherine Donnelly Foundation for funding this uh, initiative and faith in the common good for, for supporting the work that we do um, with, the, with the platforms and with uh, administrative uh, assistance to GCSM Canada. Thank you very much to Catherine, our French interpreter today. You've done a wonderful job and you had a big job. There was a lot <laughs> that we were talking about. Um, thank you to our speakers, to Mamadou, to Jonathan and Anthony, and thank you to the support people who were helping us behind the scenes at Faith in the Common Good. I hope to see you back again. Um, uh, have a great afternoon and uh, we'll have packages afterwards that we'll be sending out through email that will uh, capture any of the um, information that was shared in the chat and with a link to the recording of this uh, event this afternoon. Thank you very much everyone. I'm going to stop sharing and I will say goodbye for now. Thank you very much.